Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well. It's good to see that we've already got some uh, repeat viewers in the chat. Uh, Pawan, another TT viewer. Sarah, uh, Sarlivia, how are y'all? How are y'all doing today? Hoping, hoping everyone is doing well. Doing well. I'm hoping that yesterday's lesson didn't shock anyone too much or uh, permanently put you off of programming in C. Pointers can be a little bit difficult. Hello, Prince. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome, welcome back. But yeah, so today um, we're going to be building on what we did yesterday with pointers, and we're going to go from pointers just being kind of this you know, abstract concept of really being nothing but a memory address, and we're going to advance to a slightly more thorough understanding of pointers and how they're used by looking at some other some other applications of pointers in the C language that we're going to see very, very frequently as we write C code. So without any further ado, I just want to launch right into today's lesson by starting to do, well, really what's going to be a little bit of review. So you'll remember yesterday, we ended the stream by writing a few functions that made use of pointers given our understanding of pointers. We wrote the swap function that swapped the values of two variables, and then we wrote some functions to imitate the built-in C pre-increment and post-increment operators. And those did an okay job at showing us, you know, how how pointers worked in the abstract, but today I'd like to get a little bit more into how we're actually going to make use of pointers and some different manipulations that we can do with them that allow us to do some really, really interesting stuff. So just to review before we launch into this, let's one more time talk about what a pointer is. So a pointer in C is very simply the memory address that a value lives at. That's all a pointer is. It's just an integer that denotes the address in memory at which a value lives in the C abstract machine. And so anytime we've got a pointer, you can just swap that out in your mind for integer memory address and you'll be all good to go. Now, we also talked about how pointers in C do have this slightly obtuse notation where when we say that we want to create a pointer to something or we want to represent the address at which a particular thing lives in memory, we've got to use this notation int star, which we said we are going to read as pointer to int. And every time we have a star in a type name, we're going to add an additional pointer to to our reading of the type. And so if we have int and then two asterisks, then we're going to say pointer to for the first asterisk, and then for the second one, pointer to int. So yeah, this type int star star pointer to a pointer to an int. Taking pointers to pointers isn't something that we're going to do too frequently in C. And it's actually a little bit of an anti-pattern that in general, people say you want to avoid. Single pointers happen all the time. They're extremely, extremely frequently used. I don't think that I've really ever written a substantial C project without at least one use of pointers. Double pointers, a little rarer. Uh, we don't see these as much simply because it's not very often that we actually want a pointer to a pointer. However, we do see them happening sometimes. People can use them to represent uh, multi-dimensional arrays pretty frequently. In addition to when we talk about strings later, you'll see uh, an application of strings where we might want to give ourselves uh, the ability to have a pointer to a pointer. And then we can also have triple pointers. So in C, it's possible to go one level even deeper and say, all right, I want to make a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to something. This is in general something that you should avoid. Excessive levels of pointer nesting is a really, really common anti-pattern in C. And so there's actually a derisive term for people who, um, who use too many levels of pointer indirection. We call them three-star programmers. 
And why do we call them that? Well, I mean, you know, it's derived from the military concept of, you know, a three-star general being someone who's very highly ranking. But in C programming circles, it's somewhat of... It's somewhat of a pejorative, because what a three-star programmer means is that you are someone who thinks that it is acceptable to write types like this... in a code base. And now, there are very, very limited uses in which you may need a triple pointer, but I highly encourage you that if you ever find yourself stacking asterisks more than too deep, you take a step back and look at your design and make sure that uh, there's not a better way that you could be approaching your problem, because there usually is when you get to that level of indirection. So yeah, so that's how we read these types. And in C, we have two very helpful unary prefix operators that will allow us to create and get the value at a pointer. So the first of these was the ampersand, address of, and all that says is given a variable, return the memory address at which that value lives. And we said you can always recognize the ampersand operator, the address of operator, because address begins with A and so does the word and, which is what the ampersand represents. So yeah, so that's our address of operator. And then we have one more operator, the D reference operator, unary asterisk, which we said we were going to pronounce value at. And so just to review, this whole line of code can be read as pointer to int sum pointer equals the address of sum. We can use these plain English representations to make it easier for us to understand our pointer code. And then this line down here, we can say integer sum value equals the value at address sum pointer. Sum pointer stores a memory address, or it is a memory address rather. And so if we get the value at that address, then we're really fetching the value that lives in memory at that memory address. And so sum pointer we can see here has a value of zero. And so when we dereference sum pointer, we get the value at sum pointer we return what lives in memory at address 0, which happens to be 20. And then we used this intuition about pointers to write ourselves some simple programs. Like we said yesterday, we wrote the byte swap program, and then we wrote the pre-increment and post-increment functions. And both of those turned out to be pretty useful for us. And now today, I'd like to just start off by writing one more function to make sure that we fully understand how pointers work. And so today, the function that I want to write is an in-place byte swap. So I'm going to call this int bswap32, bswap32 being kind of this old name for a function that swaps uh, the bytes in a 32-bit int. Then we're going to call it in place. Actually, I'm going to make this a void function. And bswap32 in place is going to take a single integer pointer. And let's call this, um, yeah, I'll just call it bytes. And that's going to be the value that we want to swap. So what this function is doing is given given a number, so let's say that we're given uh, a number like the one we worked with yesterday. Let's say we're working again with um, not x dead beef. So not x dead beef is composed of four bytes. Byte one, byte two, byte three, and byte four. Because in hex, every two digits constitute a single byte. And what this function is going to do is it's going to reverse the order of these bytes. And so the EF and the DE are going to be swapped. And the AD and the BE are going to be swapped. And so we're going to end up with the number not X, EF, FE, AD, DE. And you may notice while looking at this, hey, this looks like something that I recognize. This looks like our endianness conversions that we talked about at the beginning of yesterday. And 
you would be right in that. vSwap and its variants, all of these kind of byte swap functions are very frequently used to convert between endiannesses. And it, there's not really a cross-platform way to do this, believe it or not. There are, you know, different headers on different systems. Linux or Unix has ARPA slash inet.h. Windows has something jammed under nine levels of deep macrology in windows.h. Uh, but there are different ways to do this. But we're going to write a relatively portable function today to just swap the bytes in an integer. So yeah, so that's what we're trying to do here. All right, so let's get started. So the first thing that I want to do is given four bytes, right? So I'm going to say that bytes has the pattern 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, where each one of these numbers is just an index into my integer. The first thing that I need to do is I need to swap byte 00, zero and byte 33. Three. Well, now how am I going to do that? Well, I've got an int pointer called bytes. So presumably what I could do is I could dereference this pointer, do some shifting and, you know, maybe some other stuff. And then hopefully that would give us the result that we're looking for. So let's think about how we're going to swap these bytes. Now, to do this, I want, and the result that we're trying to end up with, by the way, is 33112200. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare an integer called swapped. And swapped is going to start off not having a value at all. It's just going to, or we'll initialize it to zero just to be good C programmers. I mean, we are going to assign every byte in it as we go through this, but hey, we'll, we'll, we'll be good and just go ahead and default assign it to zero. So now the first thing that we need to do is I want to get this leading byte down into the least significant position of this integer. So in other words, I want to transport this zero all the way down to where three is. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to say that swapped or equals. So admittedly, the ligatures in my editor make this a little hard to read. So this says or equals by uh, bitwise disjunction equals bitwise or equals swapped. And now in order to get this byte down into this position, I need to shift it to the right um, 8, 16, 24 bits. So that's going to get us all the way down into the threes position. So I'm going to say, okay, swapped right shift 24. Okay, great. Oh, and not swap, sorry. Uh, value of bytes, right shift 24. And it's going to give me some type of warning about, yeah, Clang Tidy is not happy with me, and we are going to disable that check. There we go. Great. Okay. So now what we're going to do is I need to get my three byte up into the zero position. Well, and the way we're going to do that is we're essentially just going to do the inverse of what we just did. We right shifted the zero 24 bits to get it down into the uh, least significant position. So to get the least significant byte up into the most significant position, we're going to left shift the value of bytes by 24 bits. And so previously what we did is we shifted this byte down into this byte now we're also adding to swapped, we're placing into swapped this byte left shifted 24. And now you may be wondering, okay, so we're doing this left shift, but you know, it doesn't seem like that's just getting that byte. All of these others are still here too. And that's a good intuition, but it turns out not to be quite true purely because remember that when we shift, if we run out of bits into which to shift things, they will just be shifted off the end. So what this is really doing 
What this one down here is doing is it's just shifting to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And this one is shifting our three up into the leading position and then leaving zeros elsewhere. Oh, uh, XISZ in the chat says, always ignore warnings until it's too late. And with that, hello. Hello, XISZ. Welcome back. Um, yeah, in, in general, I would like to ignore that warning. It's unfortunately one that Sea Lion pops up a lot um, because it attempts to uh, enforce the coding standard required by like the automotive industry, uh, which is really, really, really strict. Um, and it doesn't allow for certain types of bit manipulations. Uh, however, uh, even JetBrains has acknowledged that this is probably a bad idea, and it's just much too strict for the majority of uses, and so they have announced that they're probably disabling that warning by default on the next version of Sea Lion. Which is good, because I always have to disable it. Anyway, now the next thing we want to do is actually something that's a little bit trickier. So, it worked very well for us to be able to shift the three up into the leading position and shift the zero down. That part, that part worked great. But now, unfortunately, we have to deal with something that's a little bit more difficult. Now we need to be able to shift the one, one and the two, two. So we're going to swap one, one and two, two, these two bytes in order to get the value three, three, two, two, one, one, zero, zero. And that is what we wanted. And so in order to do these shifts, I am going to use a slightly more complicated series of operations. And I will note for anyone in the chat, this is not the most efficient way of writing a byte swap function. It's not, it's actually pretty inefficient overall. It's not a fast way of doing this. However, it is fairly uh, fairly useful in terms of just showing the operation and then giving us a little bit of practice with pointers. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say, okay, great. So swapped or equals. And now I need to, I first want to place one one into this position that two two is occupying. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift this number, shift the entire thing shift this value, the value of bytes, I should say, down eight bits. So that places the one, one into the two twos position. So I'm gonna say value of bytes, right shift by eight. And now what I need to do is, you know, that's great. And this shift is going to give us the value zero, 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 one, one, two, two. But now I need to mask out this one one because otherwise what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to overwrite the zero that we shifted down the most significant byte that we shifted down with this two two and so i'm going to apply a bit mask with a value of hex ff zero zero to my shifted value and so this is placing the value zero 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 one one zero zero into our swapped number. And now why did we pick this value? Not X F F zero 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 or not X F F zero zero. Well we're gonna talk about hacks in the future and we should probably get there probably tomorrow um, about how to convert to hexadecimal, but the long and short of it is that in hex an F has a binary value of 15. And if you remember from when we did our binary conversions, 15 happens to convert to a binary sequence that is all ones. And so if I give you the number 15, 15 has a power of two decomposition into eight plus four plus two plus one, which in binary, can be represented one, 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 one. And so that is why we use hexadecimal digit F, this is base 10, to mask out bytes, right? If we place two Fs together, then we get eight straight digits of, of ones. 
And so what we're really doing by using the mass not x ff00 is we are masking out only this byte. When you add something with a 1, you get the value. And when you add something with a 0, due to the property that we call destruction, um, we are going to zero it out. And so what we're doing here is we're extracting the ones, we're extracting the one byte, and we're zeroing out this byte down here from our shifted quantity, which is exactly what we wanted to do to avoid overriding our least significant byte. And now to do the other shift that we now need to do, which is where we're now going to try and swap 2-2 two, two into 1-1's one, position, I'm going to use a very, very similar technique. I'm going to say swapped or equals. And now I need to shift 2-2 two, two left one byte. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, so bytes, the value of bytes, right shifted by 8 bits. And I'm going to now and that with the quantity not x ff 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And that's going to give me value 0, 0, 0, 2, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so now in total, all of these shifts are going to give us the value that we were expecting. And so now if I say that the value in bytes is equal to swapped, so I'm actually now assigning to this original integer now that I don't need any more of the bytes that are in it, right? We've done all of our swapping into swapped. I can now just assign the value of bytes to change the original integer that we were passed. Um, and, uh... Charlie asks, wouldn't it be masked with just not x ff 0, 0, 0, 0? Um, well, we can't really do that, right? Because we do want to shift this, uh, this byte down into this position. We do actually want to shift this byte left one position in order to successfully, um, yeah, in order to successfully, uh, transplant that value where we want it. Now, if you're wondering about the order of operations, yeah, we could have said, uh, you know, bytes and not x ff 0, 0, left shift 8. You could do that too. Um, I'm just doing it this way because it, in my mind, it makes a little bit more sense and it might be a little easier to understand. But yeah, you could totally uh, reverse the order of operations and that would work too. That's not gonna, that's not gonna cause you any problems. So now that we've done all this, let's go ahead and now test this. So let's go ahead and run down here into main and I'm going to go ahead and just kind of comment out the things that we did yesterday. And now what I'm going to do, and we'll explain what this if zero means later, it's just a fast way of commenting things out uh, in C. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try uh, to do my swap. So I'm going to say int um, sample equals not x. Let's go with, actually, let's just go with the number we worked with before, 00112233. Now I'm going to execute our bswap32 in place function. And now remember, if I just pass sample, this will technically work. And it, we can even compile this program, and you'll see that the program will compile if we try to do this. So I can say, you know, cc functions.c-o functions, right? We're compiling a function called functions.c, outputting to a binary called functions. And the compiler will give me a warning, but hey, XISZ just told us in the chat, we can ignore those. So if I go ahead and I run this program, then of course we're going to see our lovely output of segmentation fault. And the reason that we get a seg fault here again is because we are trying to, if we pass this integer value as this pointer, then what we're trying to do is we are trying to access, we are trying to access the value that lives at memory address 00112233, which very likely we don't have access to. Very likely that address is not allocated to our program. 
the operating system will place your program into functionally uh, random positions in memory when you run your program. You cannot have this kind of static assertion that when I launch my program, the OS will always, always, always place it at this region in memory. That's totally not how it works. And so you can't make any assumptions about where your program is going to go in memory. And so, yeah, so we can't basically rely on address roulette to say, hey, maybe we can dereference that. No, what we want to do is we want to say, well, the pointer that we want to pass is the address of a sample. So that when we dereference this pointer, when we take the value at this memory address, we get our original value sample. And now I'll go ahead and print this out just so that we can see that it's working. Okay, and let's go ahead and print sample. And let's see how that went. If this works, then we should now, when we switch back to our terminal, see um, the value that we are expecting. Okay, no warnings. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. No compiler warnings. So we're, we're in good position so far. And if we run this, then we see that, hmm, okay, well, not quite. Not quite, not quite. And I'm gonna guess that I made a typo somewhere in the shifting of this of this uh, byte. And now that happens. Hey, we're uh, we're doing this live, so we can expect an error or two. So okay, so yeah, so the issue that we ran into here um, was yeah that our shifting of two did not work. Uh, so let's see why that might have happened. Oh, an extra set of zeros, and I think. Oh yeah. Oh, so you oh, you tried to warn me about that in the chat. I apologize. I misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah, I wrote one too many pairs of zeros, and so I was essentially masking out the contents of our integer. Right, my bad. My bad. So let's go ahead and go back in here. We go back into our terminal, recompile, and run. And there we go. Now we've got our bytes swapped. Okay, great. This was a very simple application of pointers, and so, you know, hey, we're expecting that now if I switch out my number, so let's say if I go up here, I go to zero, and I just swap out this number for my personal favorite hexadecimal speak number, Beef Cafe, because it gives me this kind of mental image of some cows just kind of sitting around uh, a cafe and, I don't know, playing poker or something. Now, if we come back into our terminal, we're going to expect that this is going to work, right? Like, this will totally work. We're going to run this, and oh, well, hmm. That's not good. That's a problem. So, we can see that the BE got where we want it. But we've now got this issue of we've got all these FFs. Where are those coming from? Oh, and uh, Tuna had a quick question in the chat. When you compile the C file into a binary file with the same name as a previously compiled binary file, is the old one automatically overridden? Yes, yes, it yes it is. That's a that's a good observation. And so you'll see, so if I run um yeah, let's just run ls-l here, you'll see here's our binary, here's our binary called functions, and you can see that it's currently telling me that uh the previous version was compiled on January 6th, that is today at 1227. But now if I recompile this, well, let me make sure that the time has changed. Uh, sorry, it's not time, it's called date. There we go. Yeah, it's now 1229. And so if I recompile this now, and I look at the modification date of our file, we can see it's now changed to 1229 is the modification time. And so, yeah, so when you recompile a file with the same name, it just overwrites the old one. Good question. Very good question. So, switching back to our program here, let's think about why we might have gotten that error. That's a really kind of confusing thing to have happen. Well, let's think about what happened. So, let's step go through this step by step. Swap was initially assigned the value of bytes right shifted 24. Okay, lovely. So value of bytes, right shifted 24. So what that means is if our number is beef cafe, 
then we should get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, B, E. And that's not quite what happened. And the reason why this occurred has to do with something that we talked about on the very first day, which is sign extension. So remember that when we right shift an integer in C, there's one of two things that could happen. If that integer is signed, then we're going to get what's called an arithmetic shift, which means that as we shift our number to the right, or as we shift our value to the right, if the leading bit is a one, then we are going to fill in all of the positions before that with ones. Uh, hello, Milodaris. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. We're just uh, going through some, uh, some basics of C right now, talking about pointers. And so yeah, so if we shift this, then we would expect to get all zeros, but because B, B's hexadecimal representation, right, so B is hexadecimal 11. And if we convert 11 to binary, what do we get? We get, so since each hexadecimal decimal digit is a four bit quantity, we're going to convert this to a four bit uh, binary string. So this is 11 base 10. In binary, we get eight plus zero, plus three, plus one. And you can tell that this is now going to cause us a problem, right? We've got a leading one in our number. And so when we shift it down 24 bytes, we are also now sign extending from this B. And so that's why we end up filling all of these other bytes with ones. And now the way that we're going to avoid this is very simple. Well, I mean, there are two ways that we can avoid this. Let's let's talk about the easy, quick one first. And that is simply that after we shift, we'll apply a bit mask, right? So just like we did bit masks before for our other number, we're also going to do a bit mask here. We're going to say, well, I want you to extract only the lowest, the least significant byte of this shifted value. And this is a really, really, really common idiom that we're going to see. I mean, th th this kind of happens all the time in C programs. Most of the time when you see people starting to shift stuff around, you're going to see them start to kind of defensively apply uh, these bit masks, these single byte bit masks. And so we're going to do that here too. And so now if we run this, so now if we run this, we should, even though we did an arithmetic shift and we did sign extend our value, We've now masked out all of the sign extension. And so now if we switch this back to our terminal, we recompile and rerun, we'll see that we get the expected result, reading it backwards, B, E, E, F, C, A, oh, C, A, F, E. There we go. So there's our byte swap function. And now, this works. This is, you know, this is this is a great way to write this function. It does have a few issues, one of them being that it's it's a little slow. You know, it's not the fastest way to write this, but that is something that we can live with. But the kind of worst consequence is that this is pretty clunky, right? Like all of this logic just to swap some bytes really seems pretty inelegant. And so what if there were a better way to do this? that didn't require us to do all of this masking nonsense. And the good news, the really great news for all of us is that there is a way to do that. And this has to do with the actual different pointer types in C. So previously we were working only, we've only ever seen up to this point really, pointers to int, right? A pointer to an integer. And so when we have a pointer to an integer, that tells the C compiler that the memory address, right? So the memory address that is in that pointer and the memory address that that pointer denotes points to an int. It points to a four byte quantity. And so when we go in and we dereference this quantity, we're going to get, or when we dereference this address, we get the value at that address 
we're going to get four bytes out. We're going to get an entire int. And this works great, but, you know, we'd really like it so that we're only working with a single byte at a time here. What if we said instead, you know what? I'm only going to get a single byte at a time. I'd really like to be able to dereference this pointer and get only one byte. And the fantastic news is that we can do that in C. We can do that in C. And so let's go ahead and I'm just going to change this name really fast, bytes. I'm going to change it to just something like input. Um, and I know I've got a lot of red here, but that, that's okay for now. I'm going to change this parameter to something called input. And what I'm going to do now is I said that, hey, I would really, really like it if input could be decomposed into four bytes, none of which would do sign extension. And this is an operation that we can perform. I'm going to go ahead and include our header stdint.h. Right, so this is the header that gives us these nice fixed width integer types. And now I'm going to come back down into bswap32 in place. And I'm going to now write a uint8 sub t pointer that I'm going to call bytes. And all that that is going to be is input cast to a different pointer type. And so yeah, believe it or not, we can cast pointers. Like if you're given a pointer in some type and you're like, huh, you know, that's a really great way to actually describe the data that I'm being passed, right? We do want a pointer to an integer. We're working with an integer, but you're like, I don't want to work with it as an integer. That sucked, right? That was really inconvenient to do all those masks and shifts and all that stuff. Eh, I don't want to do any of that. I'm just going to make it a character pointer, a pointer to an 8-bit quantity that isn't going to do sign extension because it's unsigned. And we've got a question from uh, BlueJay. We could use this to cast void pointers. Oh, you totally can, yeah. And we'll talk about void pointers. Void pointers are kind of this weird, uh, like, edge case, and we'll, we'll get there. But yeah, so now, what if I rewrite this function in terms of bytes? And... It, I really, really like this example because it's it's so simple how we do this. Like it 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 is just so much conceptually easier than what we were doing previously. But I will note that there is one caveat to doing this this way, and that is that we now need to remember. Well, I guess we actually don't need to remember the byte ordering. I mean, you could, but yeah, you don't really need to even. And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to say, all right, now I'm first going to, we're actually still going to start off. Ah, you know what? No, we don't even need to do that. We don't need to swap zero, zero and three, three. I'm going to do this in a for loop. So we're going to start at zero, uh, keep it less than the size of int, right? The number of bytes in int, which just happens to be four. And we're going to increment i with each step. And now what I'm going to do at each step This is blowing my mind in the facts of anti-logical statements. I'd rather emphasize that PD what? Okay. Uh yeah, probably a bot. Um I did figure out how to ban your users since yesterday, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'll, I'll leave it for now. If they continue making noise, then I'll go into the console and handle that. Um, anyway, whatever. Uh, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to swap the bytes uh, that into this pointer that we just made. Okay, so what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to start off, and what I want to do is I want to swap the byte at position zero into position three. That is my that is my objective here. And so the very first thing we're going to do is I'm going to say um, that swapped or equals the value at bytes plus i. So yeah, so this is kind of a new thing. Yesterday, 
We were only dealing with pointers as we had written them. We weren't doing anything to our pointers after um, we had created them. I mean, we were maybe assigning some values to the memory addresses, right? But we weren't actually manipulating these pointers in any other way. Today, we're starting to do that by doing a little bit of what we call pointer arithmetic in C. And pointer arithmetic is one of these really interesting things that may or may not really be a good idea, but it is part of C, and so we're definitely going to learn about it because you will need to use it. So what we're doing here is we're saying that I'm going to get the value at the memory address denoted by bytes, right? So our initial memory address plus a certain number of bytes. And so if I want to get, let's say, this byte here, well, the memory address that that's going to live at is bytes plus two. And so, yeah, so that's how we're going to do some uh, very, very simple pointer arithmetic. Okay, great. So now that we can do that, let's go ahead and do some shifting now. So we've got this value and that's great, but currently we're just always dumping this into the least significant byte, right? If we're doing this swapped or equals a single byte, then yeah, we're going to run into uh, this issue of always overriding the least significant byte. Um, Blue Jay, so the bytes of an int are sequentially stored like an array. Yeah, they are. Remember how uh, on previous days we went through uh, these diagrams, especially on the Indianness lesson about how the bytes are ordered in memory. And yeah, an integer really at its absolute most basic level of abstraction is just a sequence of four bytes that are contiguous in memory. And so, yeah, so these layouts here where we talked about how, you know, the integer was going to span from a low address to a high address four bytes later is kind of a tool that we're using here to implement this function. And so, yeah, yeah, the bytes of an integer are sequentially stored. They are laid out sequentially in memory a lot like an array. And yeah, and that's what we're using here to do this swap. So great. So now that I've finally got my byte extracted, now what I want to do is I want to shift it into place. And so what I need to do in order to do that is I need to shift it by a certain amount, right? We need to be able to successfully, um, although is that really how I want to do this? No, we can actually do this in a slightly more interesting way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. We can actually do the exact same thing with swapped that we're doing with bytes. And so I can actually say, okay, so I'm going to have this integer called swapped. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign to the value at the address of swapped plus three minus I this value. So let's talk about what's happening here. This is definitely some slightly confusing code. So what we're doing here is we're saying that we want to assign to the address of swapped offset by three minus I bytes. The value bytes plus i. And I actually need to do one more thing. I actually need to cast this to a uint8 sub t pointer. And so what we're going to do now is we're saying, okay, so the value at the first byte of swapped offset by three minus, so three being the index of the last byte, minus the current index that we're on, bytes, is equal to the value at bytes plus i, that being the ith byte of bytes. And so yeah, so what we see here is something else that's kind of new, and that is that we can perform arbitrary pointer arithmetic on both the left and right sides of an assignment statement. Right? Kind of cool. Kind of a cool thing that we can do in C. And so now if we go ahead and we're going to recompile and rerun this program, Go ahead and switch over here to a terminal. 
recompile and rerun, we'll see that we get the same result. And the only difference between this code and the last bit of code is that I don't know about you, I find this to be a lot more concise than the previous bit of code that we had. With just a little bit more pointer manipulation. And the reason that honestly we did the pointer manipulation in the first place here is that I want to show you how pointer arithmetic in C works. So, let's talk about pointer arithmetic. And the rules of pointer arithmetic. And these are relatively straightforward, and we can get through them pretty quickly. So, pointer arithmetic. Alright, so, pointer arithmetic. Let, is, let us talk about pointer arithmetic. So, if I have a pointer to an integer. So let's say I have a pointer to an integer. We're going to call it, um, I don't know. I'm just going to call it pointer. So pointer to int pointer. And we're going to assign it, oh, I don't know, the, the address of some variable. Where some var is an int. Now that's great. I can just do things with that pointer directly. And so, you know, if I wanted to just get the value at that pointer, then I could just say int pointer val. Oh, and that's not going to be a pointer, my bad. There we go, so we're gonna say int pointer val equals the value at pointer. Right? And that's the main use of pointers that we've seen so far. We just use them to dereference directly. But, believe it or not, we can do other things with our pointers. And so, for example, if I wanted to say... Let's say that now... Instead of accessing the value that is at pointer directly... I want to access the next integer in memory. So if memory is laid out like this, then let's say that I have four bytes to represent my variable sum of var. And then after sum var, I've got some other integer quantity. I don't know. This is just, you know, some random int. Who knows? Who knows what it is? If I want to access that integer quantity, I can do it like this. I can say that I want to get the value at pointer plus one. Now you might be saying, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Plus, plus one? That's not right. That, that can't be right, right? Because here's the thing. If we do plus one, right, then I'm really just going to get the second byte of some var, and that's not what we were trying to access, right? This being byte one. And that's a really, really good intuition, but it's not how pointer arithmetic works in C. Pointer arithmetic in C is really quite the strange thing. Oh, uh, Bluejay, if there's nothing at a memory address, does it return null? So dereferencing an undefined memory address or a memory address that is not um, allocated to your program is another one of those things that we call undefined behavior. So if you try and dereference null, let's say, right? Theoretically, there's nothing that lives at memory address zero, which is what null represents, but we can't assert that on all platforms. And so we say that a dereference of an invalid memory address is undefined behavior. We can't say for certain what will happen when you try and do it. Usually it's going to end up in a seg fault. Uh, so usually the operating system is going to say, hey, not your memory, we're going to crash. But you may also get just some random junk and it, we'll see that happen in just a little bit. And so, yeah, so anyway, back to this whole plus one business. What's up with that? Well, in C, when you do pointer arithmetic, the pointer arithmetic occurs with regard to the size of the type that the pointer points to. 
And so here, if we look at int pointer, then we'll see, hey, int pointer is a pointer to an int. And so it's a pointer to a four byte quantity. And so when we do this point arithmetic, what we're really saying is that the new address is equal to pointer, right? So the address stored in pointer plus one times the size of an integer. And so the C compiler is very nice to us and it implicitly inserts this, you know, times size of int nonsense so that we don't have to keep writing it ourselves. And so when we say pointer plus one, what we really mean is the next integer sized space in memory. And so here, if pointer were stored at ad or if pointer stored zero, right, the address of some var, when we do pointer plus one, we're going to get this integer here. We could even extend this. You can add as many of these as you want. So we could say, okay, fine. Let's say that, you know, that didn't quite cut it. I want to access the next integer. You can do that too. All you've got to do is change your plus one to a plus two. To say, I want to jump now two integer size spaces in memory to get over to that integer space there. And so, yeah, so that is how pointer arithmetic in C works. It takes into consideration the size of the data structure that we are, that we have a pointer to. And this is something that trips a lot of people up. A lot of people say, hey, I want the next byte. I'm going to go ahead and um, just, you know, access int pointer plus one. And they're like, hey, that should work. And it doesn't. And they're like, well, what, what, what happened? What happened? And what happened is pointer arithmetic came in and said, no, 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 I'm not going to give you memory address, you know, pointer plus one. I'm going to give you memory address pointer plus four jumping to the next integer size space in memory. And so that's our intuition for pointer addition. So yeah, so that is pointer addition. And it, we see that in the program that we just wrote. We did a fair amount of pointer addition. Here, when we said bytes plus i, I wanted the next byte in memory, or the ith byte in memory after bytes. And that is why I made this a uint8 sub t pointer. So by making this a uint8 sub t pointer, what I have done is I have said, hey, C, when I add a value onto this memory address, I want you to add eight bits, not 32, as would happen with an int. And so doing plus I in this case only advances us to the next, uh, the next byte in memory and not the next integer. And that's so, yeah, that's why we picked an eight bit type instead of a 32-bit type, so that our pointer arithmetic would work and not do anything super duper weird. Now, coming back to this, believe it or not, we can do other pointer arithmetic too. We've done addition. We can also do, uh, Prince Logic isn't U and 8 char, yeah, roughly. Yeah, so U and 8 is unsigned char on, on my machine with my compiler. Right, we talked about how different compilers can define whatever sizes they want for uh, these different quantities. The, uh, if anyone knows of the company Cray Supercomputers, they were the big supercomputer manufacturer in uh, the 90s. They made a C compiler where for efficiency and because of the architecture of their machine, every single native type in C was defined to be 64 bits. So char was 64 bits, short was 64 bits and etc. And it, it was crazy. And if we tried to write this program using char and compiled it on that machine, everything would explode in our face. And so that is why here I picked uint8 instead of char, because we know that I'm going to have an 8-bit quantity, which is what we're wanting to work with here when we're shuffling bytes around. So yeah, that's why we picked uint8. So yeah, it on our machines that we have at home, 
It is probably equivalent to an unsigned char, but we just want to be very careful. Good question. So, we figured out how to get the next integer in memory. That was cool. How about the previous integer? Well, we can totally do that too. I can just say int prev int. equals the value at pointer minus one. And so here we can also subtract pointers. And this is going to work in exactly the same way as our pointer addition. Where we said, so our new address is going to be our pointer minus one times the size of an int. And so in this case, if we're running with this example that we've got up here, then this would give us the value at address negative four, right? Four before some var. And again, we don't know what that is, but we can, you know, we can still access it. C gives us the ability to access it. And so, yeah, and so that is how we do pointer arithmetic in C. Now, I will note, very thankfully, addition and subtraction are the only operations that you can do on a pointer in C. You cannot multiply pointers, thank God. You cannot divide pointers, even more graciously. You can't modulo pointers, you can't, you know, do any other integer operations with pointers, but if all you want to do is add and subtract, those are completely fair game, and it, you can do those really whenever you want. And again, these don't necessarily have to point to a valid memory address, and we can actually write a very brief program to demonstrate that. And so yeah, why don't we go ahead and just write a program very, very quickly that's going to show us some pointer arithmetic. And it's going to show us pointer arithmetic in the absolute worst way, but it does answer a question that was asked in the chat earlier. So this is file pointer arith. We'll go ahead and yeah, reload our CMake project. There we go. Gonna go ahead and include our standard IO and standard lib.h. And now I'm going to do something that you should never do in your C programs. I want to figure out what is in memory. What all is in memory exactly? Like how far can we go before we essentially get booted out by the operating system? How far outside of our predefined bounds can we go before the OS says, hey, stop that now. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna define an int. And this is just a dummy int. And the reason why I'm using this dummy int is that I just need a memory address inside of my program. And so now I'm going to define a pointer called pointer, which don't call your pointers pointer, but it really is here just serving as a pointer. We'll call it something a little bit better. We'll call it cursor. It's just a cursor into memory and we're giving cursor the address of dummy. So we're assigning to a pointer to int named cursor the address of dummy. And now what I'm going to do is scan memory until the OS kills us. <laughs> Bujay says Pandora's box, kind of, yeah. Yeah, so now that we know how to do pointer arithmetic, we've unleashed the lions in terms of like bad things that you can do in C that are going to cause you issues. But they're also kind of cool. So let's go ahead and do that. So for int i equals zero, i is less than, um, I don't know, how big is our program going to be? Uh, you know what, actually, here, I'm just going to define int i equals zero. And I'm going to write a while true loop. And we'll include std bool, sure. std bool to get our true macro. Yeah, never write while true loops, um, but we're going to do it in this case just because it is kind of interesting. And actually, I don't even need this I. 
So what I'm gonna do is, until the operating system kills us, I'm gonna print the values that live in memory. So I'm going to print the value at cursor. And then I'm going to increment cursor. So I'm going to increment my pointer. I'd say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. You can increment pointers? Well, like we learned yesterday. I mean, and like we wrote yesterday. Pre-increment and post-increment, all they're really doing is addition. And so when we increment a pointer, all we're really doing is adding one to the memory address of that pointer. And by adding one, I mean adding one in terms of pointer arithmetic. So what we're really doing here is we're saying we want to add four, right? Which is the size of an int to the address uh, stored in cursor. All right, there's our whole program. I didn't really need stdlib because I'm not going to give this an exit code. Again, this program does not terminate. So let's go ahead and compile and run this and just let's see what's in memory. Might be some cool stuff there. So let's switch back over to our terminal here. Go ahead and clear this out. We're going to compile our file pointer arith to a binary again called pointer arith. There it is. There's our binary pointer arith. And now when we run this, we're going to expect to see it run for just a little bit of time. And then we're probably going to get a seg fault, but let's do it. Oh, that was quick. Yeah, that was pretty quick. Okay, so, hey, we've got some different stuff in memory, and you can see we're starting off with our dummy value, and then we've got a bunch of other nonsense, and, well, what is this? So, this stuff is, well, it's all measure of things. It might be some of the code in our program. It might be other things that are on the stack. It might be constants that were pooled by our C compiler and placed to various places in memory. It might be libraries that we've linked in. It's all kinds of different stuff, but it is the contents of memory before our dummy pointer. And now we can do the exact same thing going the other way too. I can decrement a pointer too, and it's going to do the same thing. Subtract for from the address stored in cursor. And if we switch back over here, we'll see how far we can go the other way. And so yeah, so again, we were able to go pretty far. We navigated through, at this point, the entire address space of our program. But as we talked about yesterday, the second we step outside of our bounds, the operating system comes in to say, hey, you can't do that and it terminates our program and reports that a segmentation fault occurred. Uh, Raji asks, um, what if instead of only ints, it was a mix of different types? How would subtraction for pointers work? Uh, well, so every pointer is going to reference a single type, right? So we're always going to have a pointer to something, a pointer to an int, a pointer to a char, a pointer to a short. Um, and so subtraction works the exact same way. So if we had instead, uh, so if we were instead working with, let's say a short pointer here, all right? So let's say this is now not an end pointer, it's a short pointer. Then our pointer arithmetic is gonna work in the exact same way, except instead of adding the size of an int, we're going to add the size of a short instead. So yeah, all it does is it adds the size of the type that the pointer is pointing to. That is what our pointer arithmetic does. All right, and now, I'm not going to belabor pointer arithmetic anymore. This is all we need to know about pointer arithmetic. And I'm going to move on to our next topic. And you might go, hey, this seems really simple. Surely we're missing something. And we're omitting something as we talk about this, but we'll get to that tomorrow. We're not gonna talk about it today. We're now going to talk about arrays in C. Oh, didn't mean to do that. There we go. We're going to talk about arrays in C. All right. So let's get this out of our system now. 
C arrays are not like Java arrays at all. In Java, we had all kinds of different kind of, you know, assertions about our arrays and cool things that we could do with our arrays in Java. If we went out of bounds of our array, we got an index out of bounds exception, and you can already guess that C's not gonna do that. C doesn't care, right? C doesn't care what you do um, with your with your arrays, and so yeah, you can access outside of the bounds of an array. The only guarantee that we have about an array in C is an array is nothing but a contiguous region in memory that can store that can store a number of values a note I'm not going to say that they have to be values of the same type. They don't. Remember, C doesn't do any real type checking for us either. C types are basically a rough suggestion. We've already determined that we can just absolutely destroy the C compiler's internal typing, right? We can cast stuff however we want. I can make an int pointer and a un8 sub t pointer, and it's not even going to blink. <laughs> C makes our skins thicker. A little bit. It makes you, uh, in my opinion, it makes you slightly more robust programmers. It makes you consider the consequences of the code you write a little bit more than Java might. Because in Java, you at least got a backtrace to help you, and in C, you just get this phrase segmentation fall, and then you spend the next nine years of your life in GDB trying to figure out where it happened. So that will make us a little bit more robust, maybe a little more proactive programmers. And now, this is how we declare an array in C. So I'm going to say that I want to declare an array called r. So I'm going to say int r. This is an array of integers. And it's going to have the size 64. Now, coming from Java, you'll notice something. Wait, what is happening with those brackets? Why are the brackets after the variable name and not after the type name, right? In Java, we would write this like this, int array r. Well, C and Java have slightly different syntax. That's all I can really say about that. C and Java have slightly different syntax, and in C, the brackets must come after the variable name. Believe it or not, in Java, you can do it where you place these brackets after the variable name, and I oftentimes we'll have one student a semester who comes in starting to do that and i'm like you wrote c or c plus plus in high school didn't you uh and invariably they're like unfortunately um so yeah so in c the brackets come after the variable name and what this statement here does int r sub 64 is it says give me a memory region that is large enough to store 64 ints. And that's all this is doing, is it says, okay, I want a contiguous region in memory that can store 64 integers. We had some questions in chat. We'll be going over GDB. Yep, that's a future lesson. Uh, and uh, could we have an array where the elements are not of the same type? Remember, all this really is, it's a contig is... It is a contiguous memory region that can store a number of values. And notice how I said that we want this memory region here to be able to store 64 ints, meaning has enough space to store 64 ints. If we then wanted to treat this array like it was storing characters, we could do that. That's, that's licit. Not recommended, but you can do it. So yeah, so here we're going to ask for a memory region to store 64 integers. <laughs> this is chaos. Arrays in C are kind of weird, and it gets more chaotic, believe it or not. But arrays in C are very simple, and we're actually about to learn something that may blow a few people's minds. And that is how array indexing in C works. So let's say that I want to access the second value in this array. Int 
let's so, so let's say you know I just want to say actually I'm not even gonna give it a type I'm just gonna say R at two now in C the thing that we have to remember and the thing that's going to frustrate us over and over and over and over again is that an array variable is nothing but a pointer. Again, an array is nothing but a pointer. And so really, I'm even going to write here, arrays are really just pointers. And what do they point to? Well, they point to our contiguous memory region. So arrays are really just pointers. And so believe it or not, this array indexing statement right here is converted by your C compiler into saying the value at R plus two. Oh, and yeah, XISZ, that is the value of the third index. That That's true. Um... I do speak about arrays in terms of like second being technically the third value, and I use the phrase zeroth to refer to uh, the you know the first element, uh, which is a little bit chaotic, but it does reflect uh, how we how we write these things in code. And so generally, I like to stick with those terms as opposed to no, you're good, no, you're totally good. It's it's I admit that it is a little bit confusing. I just try and prevent as many mental off by one errors as possible because otherwise this would be much longer than it is. Um, <laughs> But no, you're, you're totally good. Thank you for clarifying. Some people may have been confused by that. Always good to ask questions. So yeah, what all this is really doing is it's saying that I want to get the integer value at array offset by two. Right? All it is, is it's pointer arithmetic. It's the same pointer arithmetic that we were doing earlier. And so now this gets down to how arrays are numbered from zero. Why are arrays numbered from zero? Well, because this notation here with these square brackets, again, all this actually means is this. All this means is that we want to get the value at array, right? So at our pointer, plus zero. So in other words, the first element in our array. And so yeah, that is why, oh, I didn't know these tracks had applause. Um, anyway, and so that is why, uh, and so that is why arrays start from zero. Yeah, that's it. It's because we're doing pointer math and our offset for the first element in an array from the pointer or for the zeroth element in an array, right? The, the, the first value we can access is zero. And so yeah, so this is why in a systems programming languages, arrays should start from zero. Which I know most of us are computer scientists. This isn't like a controversial opinion. Um, but it is something that I ran into a lot when I was taking a linear algebra class. And for the first few weeks of the course, my professor was trying to number things from one, and uh, my class full of computer scientists and electrical engineers just weren't having that. So we uh, we requested several times, and he finally relented, to start labeling our matrices from zero, which is not the convention that is used in math, but is the convention that we all used in our head because we were all thinking of them as arrays for the entire course. So yeah, so arrays start from zero. Arrays start from zero in, from zero in C2. And... It, other than this, you can <laughs> peer pressure, exactly, yeah. Um, and so we can really think of arrays, again, as just pointers. And so let's go ahead and write a program that does some stuff with an array. So let's say that, oh, I don't want a header file. I do want a source file. So let's say I'm going to write a program called arrays.c, and we're going to demo how some arrays work. Alrighty, so... Let's go ahead and add an executable for this, just so that we can run it. Arrays, arrays.c. Alrighty, there we go. Arrays.c, perfect. Okay, so we'll go ahead and include our standard header. All right, we'll return a success exit code. Okay, cool. 
So now, what I want to do is I want to declare an array. I'm actually just going to declare my array of 64 ints. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, okay, int, uh, yeah, I'll just call it int r. And we're saying that it's going to be 64 integers long. Okay, great. So now we theoretically have an array that is large enough to store 64 ints. And so what I can do is I can populate this array with some stuff. All right, and I'm going to say uh, that r at i equals i. So we're just going to fill the array with its indices. And now in C, we talked the other day uh, when we were talking about functions, how C does not do what Java does. And when we declare a variable, it zeroes it out for us. Same thing with arrays. All this directive is saying is it's saying, hey, I want you to give me enough stack space to store 64 integers. It's not assigning values to that. And so if we just print out this array, we're going to get a bunch of junk. All right, we're going to get a bunch of junk just like we did with the ints because we have not assigned values to those positions in memory yet. And so that's what we're doing here. We're just going to fill the array with its indices. And now I'm going to go ahead and write a function to print the array. Or we'll just write a little routine to print the array. So I'm going to say print the array. And say 4 into i equals 0. i is less than 64. i plus plus. r at i. Oh, not r at i. Sorry, printf. r at index. And we'll say percent 2d equals. Um, and then the value. And so our value here is going to be, let's see here, we've got 2d, and that is going to be our value, or index, sorry. And then we've got the actual value in the array. All right, and if we run this, then we'll see that arrays work kind of how we were expecting, right? We're going to see that we've got our value stored from 0 up to 63, and they've got the values we were expecting. And now this is great. This is how we wrote array code in Java. We recognize these for loops. But, you know, there's something about this that I don't really like too much. And that is that I've hard coded the size of this array. Right now in Java, if I wanted to get the size of this array, it was really simple. I just say r dot length and we'd be done. C, well, first off, arrays in C do not have um, these kind of, you know, instance variables or variables in them that we can access using the dot operator, so that's going to be our first problem. Um, but we can get around this. Well, you know, I want the size of this array. And, you know, I've been using, and yeah, Prince Logic in the chat suggests, hey, we've got this thing in C called size of. Surely that will work. So, okay, great. Size of array. Cool. We're going to iterate through the size of the array. Let's do it. Huh. Oh, did I mess something up here? Um, I is less than the size of array. I plus plus. This is a, uh, okay, let's run this under GCC. I think that uh, Visual Studio may be trying to do something interesting with us. Apologies for the strange background noise. I'm, uh, I'm using some public domain recordings of Buchtehuda today, and uh, it seems like we've got some interesting little uh, tidbits in these. So let's move on to our terminal here, and let's recompile our program. So. We've got this program called arrays. I'm just going to compile it. cc arrays.c dash o arrays. If we run it, dot slash arrays. Oh, uh oh. Well, that's an interesting one. This is something new. We haven't seen this before. So, first off, we've obviously got a problem because we massively overflowed our array, right? We went way beyond the bounds of this array. And second off, our runtime actually did something interesting. It said, okay, stack smashing detected. So what stack smash, what, uh, yeah, stack smashing means is that you attempted 
to access something on the stack, and you attempted to assign to something on the stack, or just you attempted to use something on the stack that you did not allocate yourself. And so here, what's happening is that you notice we've gone way beyond the bound of our array, and the compiler didn't care. The runtime also didn't care. And so what happened is we were allowed to go way beyond the bounds of our array and finally got this stack smashing warning once we hit a sigil value on the stack that indicated to the runtime, hey, 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 you tried to assign to something that you did not allocate yourself, and so we're going to terminate you. And so it, it's basically another type of seg fault, but it's a seg fault that happens within your own process, within the running instance of your program. Oh yeah, and XI said, yep, you're correct. Yeah, there's no bounce checking. And so obviously this didn't work. And now what we'll notice is that we went up to index 255 here, which happens to be 64 times four, which is the size of integer. So when we did size of an array, we actually got the total number of bytes that the whole array occupied, not the number of elements. And so in order to get the number of elements, there's this really, really common idiom that you'll see C programmers use. And that is we're going to divide the number of bytes required to represent the whole array by the number of bytes required to represent a single value in the array. And so here we're taking the size of our array, which is 256, dividing it by the size of the value at array index 0, which just happens to be, well, since these are ints, every value in our array is presumably going to be an int, which is 4. And so we're going to end up with 256 divided by 4, which gives us 64, the size of our array that we were expecting. So awesome, we can update our statements there, and now if we go back and try and run this, and we clear out from our uh, lovely stack smashing, that's a super fun term. We'll see that we get the expected result. And so yeah, so this is the first wonky thing about C arrays. If we take size of on a C array, then it's going to give us the size of the whole array, not the number of elements. So we've got to divide it by the size of each element to get the number of elements. Just kind of some, you know, weird C stuff. But okay, great. Now this works. This works. This is cool. This is cool. But you know, I'd actually really like, if I'm going to be working with arrays a lot, I would like something that's kind of like arrays.toString. I want a function that prints my array to the console. And yeah, prints logic. Yeah, there's no dot .length for arrays. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this is C. We don't, yeah, we don't have the ability to access, you know, a property on a contiguous region of memory, right? All an array really is is a pointer. C arrays... Well, 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 we'll get to this. We'll get to, we'll get to we'll get to something about this. So yeah, I want to now extract my function to print the array. And so I'm gonna write a function up here. I'm just gonna write a function called void print array. And this is basically gonna do what arrays.toString in Java did. We're just gonna go through, we're gonna print every element of the array. So we're gonna say, okay, print array. Uh, and we're gonna take in an int array. Oh. Alright. And all I'm going to do is, you know, this code should just work, right? This is a function. I should be able to just go ahead and copy this up here. And to print the array, now all I need to do, very graciously, is just call print array. All right, let's do it. So now, we've got our program. Now we're going to print an array. And all we've done is relocate some code, right? All we've done is extract some code out into a function. We have factored our code. We call that pattern factoring, of taking code and extracting it into a function. So now let's go ahead and switch back to our terminal, and let's just confirm that things are working. I mean, you know, there's no reason that they shouldn't, so we're going to compile this and eh, ignore the errors, whatever, we don't care. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. We only printed the first two elements of our array. Well, that's what we call really annoying. Why on earth would that happen to us? Well, so here's another thing about C arrays, and this is one of the most frustrating things about C arrays, is that remember I said C arrays 
are just pointers. The C arrays are just pointers. They're just pointers to a contiguous region of memory that is large enough to hold a certain number of values. And the C language does not distinguish between a pointer and an array outside of the current scope. So inside of this function, I was completely okay to just do, you know, i less than size of array divided by size of array at zero, and that gave me the number of elements in the array. But when I passed this array up here to this function print array, what really happened is the C compiler lowered my array to a pointer. It's just a pointer now. And so when I call size of on array, I'm getting the size of not this entire array, but I'm getting the size of the pointer, which is eight bytes long. And so we've got an eight byte long pointer divided by the size of an integer gives us two, and that's why we got two iterations on our for loop. And so the question you might ask now is, oh, wait, so there's no way to actually get the size of an array in C outside of the scope in which it was declared? And you'd be completely correct, there's not. So what we have to do is anytime we are writing a function that deals with arrays, anytime we are writing a function that deals with arrays in C, this is crucial, you must pass as an additional parameter the size of that array. And so here we're going to modify our function now to iterate through r size. And yeah, yeah, Prince Logic, no way. Yeah, yes way. This is totally how you have to do things. And if you look at the C standard library, you'll see that all of the functions that work on things that are arrays, first off, are just declared to take pointers, and second, require sizes. So yeah. Kinda crappy. Kinda, it's not fun. It's really not fun. But it's just an aspect of the language. Arrays are nothing but pointers, and so if we want to figure out how many elements come after that pointer, we've got to tell the compiler. And so now I can say that I want to print my array, and it's 64 elements long. And now if we go back to our terminal and we recompile and run this, First off, that error that we got before went away. It was just an error telling us, hey, I don't think you mean the call size of here. You called size of on a pointer. And there we go. Now we're all good. We've got all 64 elements being printed. So yeah, that's how we work with arrays in C. Arrays, you have to specify the length of your array if you are passing it to a function. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You just have to. So yeah, kind of, kind of annoying, kind of annoying. And XISZ says, yeah, your arrays are declared as constants in the best case. And that's true. Uh, yeah, in the ideal case, um, you know, you wouldn't have to be continually recomputing these things. You would just, you know, define uh, an integer. We'll talk about what static and const mean uh, in a future day. But yeah, we would define an integer, you know, something like, uh, you know, R size equals 64. And then we would just write that everywhere instead of repeating these computations. And yeah, and we could and we could do it that way too. And that's something that you'll see happen uh, a lot of the time is where C programmers will declare their array sizes all as constants so that they can use them throughout their program. And this version of the program is going to run exactly the same way as the previous version. Um, and I'm going to ignore that, I think. Yep, there we go. Okay, great. And now we've got the exact same output that you can't see. But there we go. We've got the exact same output. Yeah, that's pointers in C. Really annoying. We straight up have to pass sizes around, but it's just part of the language. And now we're going to very briefly talk about multidimensional arrays. It's not something that you're going to see very frequently at all, but it is something that we need to know about. So in C we can declare multidimensional arrays just like we could in Java. The difference between C and Java is that in Java, when you declared a multidimensional array, so in Java, when you declared a multidimensional array, if you said, you know, R 
you know, 64, 32. Actually, I'm going to make these sizes that I can draw. Uh, so if you try to make a 4x3 array in Java, what happened is the compiler would say, okay, so I'm going to make four integer arrays. And actually, let me write this in proper Java just so that it's not confusing to anyone who's reading the notes. So if I wrote, yeah, new int for... Four, three. Then what would happen is we would make an array that contained four elements, and each one of those elements was a reference to an array of length three. And so each one of these would point to an array of three ints. There's one. There's one. There's one. These aren't linked list cells. These are arrays, I promise. There's one. And there's one. And so, yeah. And so, in Java, we would say, okay, so this reference is going to point here. This reference points here. This reference points here. And this reference points here. Oh, adverse space, you got confused here? Uh, you can go ahead and say, yeah, what's uh, what's confusing you about this? <clears throat> so yeah, so in, so in Java, when we tried to make a new array, if we made a multi-dimensional array in Java, then that array was actually an array of references, right? Java arrays only store references. Oh yeah, these ones down here are the second dimension of our array. Right, so because this is a 2D array, our array is actually an array of references to arrays of size 3. And so yeah, so that's what we've got going on here, is that this array is storing references to other arrays. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. And this is one way of storing arrays, but in C, that is not how it works. That is not how it works, because in C, we want to make our memory representation as compact as possible. And so in C, if I say int r with size, with dimensions 4, 3, what's going to happen is we are going to allocate one big contiguous array that is large enough to store 12 integers. So it's going to be large enough to store 12 integers. And so, you know, we've got something like, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There we go. So there's our array. Oh, I did that wrong, didn't I? Yes, I did. It's supposed to be able to store 12. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it's large enough to store 12 integers. And these integers are stored in what we call row major order. So what does row major mean? Well, if we think about our array as a matrix that has four rows and three columns. So a matrix that has four rows and three columns. Let's say there's our matrix. Then position A11 in this matrix is going to correspond to the first element in our row major order array. The next element, A12, is going to come next in our array. And then our next column is going to be placed after that. Once this is done, we move on to the next to the next row, and we say A21 is here. A22 comes next. A3, A23, after that, and so on. 
And so what you can see is that individual rows, so individual rows of our array, if we consider this to be the blue row, and this to be the red row, well then these rows are stored contiguously in memory, right? So that row is all glommed together, and this row is all glommed together. So yeah, we call this row major order. And this turns out to be really, really important for us when we're trying to write efficient code. And it, once you get into your, uh, your computer architecture class, you'll learn about caching and why that is. But we can just very briefly summarize why we would want to do this as accessing things that are near to each other in memory is faster than accessing a bunch of things that are far away from each other. And so here, the typical access pattern for an array is to access the columns in each row and then move on to the next row. And so in other words, we would access it like this, where we would start here and then we would go across this column and then we'd go down here and then over to this one in this kind of zigzag pattern. That's typically how we work with arrays. So we store them in row major order just because it's a little bit faster for contemporary computers. So yeah, so that is how, um, yeah, that is how our multi-dimensional arrays work in C. And so let's say now that I want to extend our little demo program to deal with a multi-dimensional array. So let's do that. And it's very, very easy to do. So now I've got, let's see here. So we're going up from I equals zero, I less than R size, I plus plus. Let's go ahead and just add another dimension real quick. So we're going to substitute I for J. And I'm going to assign array at I sub J equals, um, and let's just assign it, I don't know, I times J, something like that. Something that's a little bit easy. Oh yeah, adverse space. Yeah, thank, I'm glad that, I'm glad that that uh, explanation was helpful for you. Glad that that was able to help. All right, and so now let's do the fun one. So now, okay, now we talked about how if we want to actually use an array in another function, we have to pass its dimensions. So here, now that we've got a two-dimensional array, I actually now need to go in, and I, by the way, I'm gonna make this substantially smaller. I'm gonna make this eight by eight. Uh, 64 by 64 is not a reasonable uh, amount of memory to work with for right now. But yeah, so I had to pass the dimension of that single array. And well, if we want to access a 2D array as a 2D array, then we're going to pass both of its dimensions. So now I'm going to call this r rows int r calls for the rows and columns of the array. And I'm going to do the exact same thing that we did earlier. And so I'm going to say, okay, so I equals zero, blah, blah, blah. We're going to have a loop for J as well. Looping through the columns. Awesome. And now what I'm going to say is R at I sub J equals this value. So I J R at I at j. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and compile this now and see what our output is. And we're expecting just to see our nice pretty array contents just like we did before. Oh, and okay, right, 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 right. I need to actually um, specify my second size, right? So this is a square array, so I'm just going to say r size. There we go. Let's try it again. And oh, we still get this error. So we get an error and it says, hey, subscripted value is neither array nor a pointer nor vector. Now, what on earth does that one mean? Well, we saw earlier that when we use the square bracket operator on a pointer, we got, um, or we were able to access, we were able to get um, a an integer, right? We were just doing a dereference of that pointer. And so here what's happening is when I access r at i, I'm dereferencing 
R and I, and actually just getting a pointer, or I'm sorry, not getting a pointer, getting an integer value, and then when I try and take the subscript of that, it's saying, hey, you can't dereference an int, so I'm not going to let you. And XISZ says you need to separate the arrays in the print. Um, and we could do that, but I'm really actually just trying to access the value at rij. And now, so here comes another kind of secret of C. We can hide this problem if we really wanted, and I can say, okay, well, you know what? Screw it. Each one of these values is going to be a pointer to a pointer to array. And this is what people sometimes do. It's very intuitive because it makes the error go away, right? But it's wrong. Yeah, XIS said, don't, don't actually do this. Don't do this. It, it's actually not quite correct. It's not correct because guess what? The things that live in the first dimension of this array are not integer pointers, right? They're not pointers. They're actually, they're not pointers. They are integer values. And so if we try and dereference one of these, Right, if we try and, you know, just kind of paste over this issue by just adding a star, like beginner C programmers often do, then we get a seg fault because I tried to dereference an integer value, right? R and I gave me an integer value, and I tried to dereference that, and that wasn't an address that's in our program's address space, and so I got a seg fault. That's not good. So, how can we, can we tape over this? Well, we can. And the way that we're going to do it is by making use of row major ordering. And so if we switch back to our drawing here, right, and actually I'm going to actually draw one more row of this just to make it very clear what's going on. So let's go ahead and put in our additional row A31, A31, A32, A32. A33, A33, there we go. Let's say that I am trying to access A32. So in other words, I want to access what in Java we would write A at 2 at 1. And if we did this in Java, then hey, we would get the value that we're expecting we would get a32. But we've seen that we cannot do that in C. It's not going to let us um, subscript an integer, very rightfully, because it's not a pointer. We can't, uh, we can't dereference things that aren't pointers. And so in C, what we have to do instead is we have to do math. Yay, everyone's favorite, right? So we've got to actually do some math in C to figure out where does this array index live? And so let's look and see. Okay, so we've got A32. Now, A32 is on the second column of the third row in our array. And so what we would do in Java, and what Java did is it said when we accessed A21, is it said, okay, I'm going to get the second index in this first level array, and then go down to the first index and your second level array, right? That was the access pattern for that statement, and it worked great. Now, we want to mimic this in C. We want to mimic this access pattern. We want to mimic the ability to traverse through the rows of an array first and then go down to the columns. And we can actually do this very capably using some simple math. So in C, what we're going to do is I'm going to say, so I'm still going to access my array and we're still going to use the subscript operator. But now what we have to do is we need to factor in the size of our rows. So each row here is three elements wide. And so if I want to access A32, what I need to do is I need to skip through these first two rows and then jump to that element within our third row. And so what I need to do is starting at the very beginning of our array, 
I need to skip over row one. Oh, hello. Don't do that. I need to skip over row one. Right here, skip over row one. I also then need to skip over row two. And then I can finally jump to the actual value that we were looking for in row three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our row number, row two, and multiply that by the width of our array, right? So by the number of columns in each row. And so this is two times the width of our array plus one. And that will give us the same value, A, three, two. And let's just make sure that works. So let's say, okay, great. So if we do our math here, then well, okay, so the width of this array is three. So this is really two times three plus one yields an offset of seven. And let's see if that works. If we go in our array and we go to offset zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. We got the value that we were looking for. And so in C, to access multidimensional arrays, very, very often we will find ourselves doing some simple math. I will note the math is almost never more complicated than this. This is about as hard as it gets, but it is still something that we've got to keep in mind. And so now if we go back and we try and rewrite our print array function for our multidimensional array, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my row, multiply it by the width of the array, and then add my column. And I'm even going to rename these variables just to make this a little bit clearer. So I now is going to be called row because that is what it represents. And J, I'm going to call column. Or call for short. Great. So now if we come back and we try and compile and run this program. Uh, we've still got an error. What does it not like now? Um, oh, right. It's telling me that we actually have um, an array of pointers. Uh, or, well, no, it's not telling me that we have an array of pointers. It's just telling me that, like, you know, we've got an array. And, and that's fine. That's a warning that we're going to ignore for now. But now if we run this, we see, hey, we've got the contents that we were expecting. And, you know, the contents of this array, because we are multiplying the row by the column, is a multiplication table, like you probably worked with in elementary school. Right? One times everything is in itself. Two times everything is that times two times three, etc. So yeah, so that is how we are going to work with multidimensional arrays in C. We've got to do a little bit of math, but if you remember row major ordering, then it will make sense. Okay, great. So there is arrays. That's pretty much everything we need to know about arrays in C. And when we talk about the heap, so when we talk about dynamically allocated memory, we'll come back to arrays, but only very briefly. The, the basic concept isn't going to change at all. So yeah, so that is how we're going to work with arrays in C. And for whoever said it was chaos, yeah, Blue Jay, you said a while back, this is chaos. You can see why I did partially agree with you. It's a little confusing, but we can make sense of it. And if we just remember the rules that an array is nothing but a pointer to a continuous region of memory, and that when we dereference a pointer, we get a value. So if we have a pointer to an int, we get an integer then all of our rules for dealing with multidimensional arrays begin to make sense. And XISZ and BlueJ in the chat both predicted the next thing that we're going to talk about. Strings. Extreme scare quotes on these. Because C strings are a hack. They're, they're a disgusting hack, and that's really all they are. Um, back in the olden days when programming languages, systems level programming languages were still fighting it out, two of the big contenders for who would take the crown of the next big programming language that everyone used were a language, were C, the language we're working with now, and a language called Pascal. Now, Pascal, I, Pascal, I, I think I, uh, mixed things with Haskell, sorry, uh, yeah, Pascal, uh, named after famous mathematician Blaise Pascal, was... 
a language that had a lot of really cool aspects to it, and in my opinion, one of the coolest aspects was that strings stored a size. You could get the size of a string in Pascal. Strings were their own type, they had special properties, you could do special things with them. C, on the other hand, decided, no, 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 we want to do things fast. We want to do things with as little memory as possible. We don't want to waste space storing the size of a string. And so let's now talk about how C does strings without actually knowing what size the string is. And so, yeah, so let's now talk about strings. Now, we've seen very frequently by now the use of strings in C. We've seen them in all of our printf or putf statements. They look basically the same way that strings in Java did. We used to say, you know, something like if we wanted to say hello in a string, we would just write hello. And now the type of this string in C, if we were doing this in Java, you're very well aware that we could just write, you know, String greeting equals that. And by now you should know that things in C are not going to be that simple. The type of a pointer, I'm sorry, the type of a string in C is what a lot of people very affectionately refer to, affectionately maybe resulting from trauma, we're not really sure, as char star. And so char star greeting equals hello. And you'll remember from what we discussed earlier that we can read char star as pointer to char. So all that a string in C is, is it's a pointer to some characters. And moreover, this syntax that we have in C, this string literal syntax here, we're saying, you know, quotes hello is actually nothing but syntactic sugar for this. So a string in C is really just an array of characters. Yeah, that is what our string actually is. This kind of double quote syntax is just syntax sugar. It doesn't do anything special in C. All that it's doing is it's saying, I want to declare an array of characters. That's all that it's doing. So yeah, when we say hello, it's decomposing to this array, H-E-L-L-O. Backslash zero. What on earth is the backslash zero? And let's, let's highlight the backslash zero, and I'm gonna highlight it in red because it's going to make you see that in a little bit. Backslash zero. This is what we call the null terminator. The null, N-U-L, because that is its code in ASCII, the null terminator. Oh boy. FDA, uh, compiler warning, assigning char pointer to string literal. Oh, are you telling me that I should declare it as const char pointer? We haven't learned about const yet. We'll get there. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Not, not quite yet though, but yeah, you are, you are correct in that I should, um, not immediately assign this just a char star, but for simplicity, we're, we're saying char star. And you could say char array too, so you could say, you know, this is equivalent, right? So this is, you know, equivalent to saying char greeting array, right? Because it is really an array. It just seems that if you do it this second way, like, C programmers will slap you. So yeah, we, we want to use char star if at all possible. And so yeah, so we're going to use char star. And so yeah, anyway, this backslash zero thing, this null terminator, what is that? We didn't write that. Why are you putting a random character at the end of my string? What are you doing? Don't do that. Well, what's happening is, remember how I said in Pascal, we had this really nice thing of the fact that strings stored a length, right? And so we could just say string.length. And Pascal knew that if you were trying to do things with this string, if you wanted to move this string to another region in memory, you would move the length of the string. C doesn't have this. C does not store the length of a string, so we have to have some way that indicates 
that your string has ended. And so as a result, we use this character null, this character with ASCII value zero that indicates the string is over. So all strings in C are what we call null terminated because they end with a null character. And so yeah, so whenever you see that double quote syntax, whenever you're working with strings in C, you've got to remember that they have a null terminator at the end. And so you might now say, well, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. So in C, strings are just arrays. And actually, they're not even arrays. They're just pointers. All strings are pointers. How do we work with these things? Like, how do we work with these disgusting things? And the saving grace that we have is that C, the C standard library, actually includes some very nice functions. Nice. Nice, in quotes. Uh, functions for dealing with strings. And these live in the header. String.h. So yeah, these live in the header string.h. Uh, and FDA0 said in the chat, if you want to reserve memory that is usable, you need to use the, uh, the, the bracket declaration. Um... And that is true. That is true. Yes, yes. In, uh, within uh, a function, if you're trying to stack allocate a string, then yeah, you need to use the, the brackets. But typically, it seems like we're usually actually allocating our strings either implicitly as function parameters, or we're doing it um, in, in stat with static linkage. And if that's all gibberish to our, our friends who might not be as experienced with C, that, that's okay. We're going we're gonna to get to that stuff. We're going to talk about the linker. It's going to be great. You're going to go, why on earth does code work like this? Computers are hard. But anyway, let's play with strings now. We're going to write another program now over here in our IDE to work with some strings. So I'm going to add another executable to my CMake list and make sure that we don't have an extra uh, suffix there. So yeah, let's play with strings. So I'm going to go ahead and include my standard functions that we're used to, or my standard headers that we're used to, scdio and standard lib. And now I'm also going to go ahead and include string.h so that we can play with some strings. All right, and we're going to return exit success. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I just want to declare a string. So why don't we go ahead and work with this greeting that we were working with earlier? So I'm going to say char greeting equals hello there we go so we've got our char greeting equals hello and now the very first thing that i want to do with this string is let's say that i want to determine how long this string is All right i want to get the length of the string well to get the length of a string we use a function called strlen. So strlen is a function from string.h that takes in a string and returns how many characters are in it, excluding the null terminator. And so we would have, so if we wanted to say, okay, we've got hello, then we want the length of this to be five, not including our null terminator. And that is what strlen is going to do. So if I want to just print the length of my string, so I'm going to print out the length of the string itself, right? So we do want to actually print the string just so we can see it. And then we're going to call strlen on my string. And now if we run this, then you'll see that the length is what we were expecting. Our length was five. Uh, and Prince Logic asks, isn't there, oh, do you mean like a header file that includes the whole standard library? Uh, and yeah, I know that C++ does have that. Um, I'm actually not really sure. I've never encountered it. I know C++ does have that, um, but I'm not really sure if C does, and I've never really needed it. I typically prefer to keep my imports or my includes as restrictive as possible. So I don't want to include the whole standard library. I'd really rather only include the little bits um, that we're going to use. 
And FDA Zero says, you recommend implementing all these functions yourself. Oh yeah, they're super easy. And the reason we're not gonna do that right now is that a lot of my students are watching this who are about to take a computer architecture course, and that's an assignment uh, that they may have. Uh, at least it has been an assignment in the past of having to having to re-implement large parts of string.h. So we're not going to help them cheat today. Uh, sorry guys, that's not what we're about. Um, but yeah, you will actually probably write lots of these functions and they're super duper easy. I mean, they're, they're really, really easy to work with. And so now what this function is doing is what Sterline is doing is it's just iterating through our string. And so it's iterating through our, got here. Sorry about that. Wrong, uh, wrong slide. It's iterating through our string and it's just incrementing a counter every time we see a character until we hit an old terminator. And so it's going, okay, we see an H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, null terminator, so we're going to stop and return a length of 5. And so yeah, that's all Sterline is doing, is it's iterating through our string. And so, unlike in Java, in C, getting the length of a string is an order n operation. It's order n, it's not constant time, like it was in Java, and you could just, you know, write string.length everywhere frivolously and it didn't matter. No, 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 in C, this is order n, and so if you need to use the length of a string multiple times in a function that you're writing, cache it, store it in a variable. Only run sterline once because that can kill your performance. If you're iterating through, let's say you've got a two gigabyte long string that you're iterating through every single time you need its length and you access its length, you know, 50 times, that's a pretty substantial performance impact. So yeah, cache your string lights if you if you um, need to if you need to use them. Let's talk about some other super fun string functions in the C standard library because this is where we're going to end today. Just talking about fun things in string.h. So let's say that I now I don't want to get the length of the string. I want to figure out where something is in the string. More specifically, I want something that is equivalent to, and actually we'll write uh, these things in Java, right? So this was string.length. What we're gonna write now is we're going to write string.index of. And the function that we have for that in the C standard library is called, yeah, there we go, is called stercher, which takes a character string and then the code point we want to look for and now a brief note about naming oh yeah an fda zero yeah we haven't talked about structs yet but yeah you could totally implement a a length tagged string um and i mean that's basically what c plus string type is so yeah it, it's and it's trivial to do uh yeah and you wouldn't need to null terminate it yeah exactly um and yeah and you could do that and that might be something that we can play with in the future, but yeah, for now, we're just gonna stick with the standard strings. And so yeah, so let's talk about naming. Some of you had me as your teaching assistant for a data structures course. And if you wrote function names like this, then likely what would have happened on that assignment is I would have given you a note that said, minus one, what are these function names? We have more characters. You know that you can type and you have autocomplete, right? Well, here's the thing. Back when the C standard library was first standardized and it was first written, you didn't have the theoretically infinite identifier lengths that you have now. And in fact, some C compilers, the first C compilers, had an identifier length limit of six characters. And so, as a result, all of these stupid names that are only six characters long were out of necessity. They didn't have any more characters to use. They had no more characters at their disposal, and so we had to use these super short names. And so this function that we pronounce Sturcher, bad name, but hey, we'll go with it, that we pronounce Sturcher is equivalent to doing string.index of. And so if I wanted to say printf, you know, index of, I don't know, let's get the index of the E in our string. I'm gonna pass greeting. I'm gonna say Sturcher, pass it my string, and then the character that we want to look for. And it, uh, let's see here, what do you not like? Uh, but has type stir. Um, oh, right, yes, right, right, right. 
And this actually isn't exactly equivalent to index of. This actually gets the address of the character. And so this gets address of code point in string. But this is actually super duper useful because we can use it to manipulate the string a little bit more, right? Our strings in C are actually somewhat recursively defined uh, in that if you have an address into a char array, if you've got an index into a char array, or if you have an address that points to a char, you have a string. And so as a result, I'm just going to go ahead and print out the pointer. Although we could also go ahead and make sure that this works by printing out the value at that address. So this is going to return a char pointer. And if we get the value that's at that address, then we are going to presumably see the character itself, which should be an E. And if we run this, well, there we go. And we see that we've got an E. However, that's not the only fun function that we can use to access addresses of code points. So let's say that I'm now going to look for L, and I actually do want to print out this memory address. So the first L in our string is an address this stuff. And this refers again to the first L in our string. But now let's say, well, okay, you know, that's kind of cool, but I actually didn't want the first L, I wanted the second one. Where I wanted the second L in our string. Well, we can do that too. So we can say printf address of second L in S. And there are two ways that we can do this. I'm going to do it the dumb way first. So remember that Sturcher, right? So Sturcher returned a pointer to the character. And so if I want to get to the second L, then I want to start looking for an L past the first one. So I can just say, okay, char pointer uh, past L is Sturcher of greeting looking for L plus one. So we're going to advance to the next character after the first L. And so now I can go ahead and do this and I can say, you know, past L. We can do Sturcher past L looking for L. And if we run this, then we should see two memory addresses, and we do, right, that come right after each other. And so you can see that the first L was at EFF7C2, the second one at EFF7C3. And in fact, you can also see that as we changed the starting address, we truncated our string, right? We went from having all of hello to cropping off just low. Very biblical. And so yeah, so... That is one way that we could get this second L. But I don't really quite like that. So I'm going to use another function. And let me make sure we've got it on Windows. We do. Good. So I want the address of the last occurrence of a code point. I'm going to use a function called str archer. And this was a later addition to the C standard library. But this is a lot like a reverse index of. It's going to get the index of the last occurrence of a character in a string. And so I could also get the address of the second L by instead of doing all of this past L nonsense, I could just use greeting and call stir archer instead. And you'll see that we'll get the same output. And now I, I will note here that, again, the function names are just getting more and more cryptic as we go. Stir Archer is the equivalent of Sturcher, which searches a string for a character. And this one searches from the right end of the string instead of the left. I know, it, it's, it's weird, it's wonky, but hey, it works. So yeah, so Stir Archer searches for the last occurrence of a character. It searches from the right instead of the left, and that's why we have that R there. Great, okay. And so, 
now you're like, well, okay, this is great. We've got some functions in string.h, but you know, let's say that I just want to, you know, look up an arbitrary function, find a function of, you know, just how do I do something using the C standard library? And my response to you would be, well, we have this absolutely amazing tool that's incredibly useful for figuring out anything there is to know about the C language. And that, of course, is this awesome tool that we call Google. You can just search string.h and you'll probably find some documentation of it. Which is cool. But, you know, I don't always want to have to Google things, right? Don't always want to have to use Google. And so there's actually another way that we can get information about these functions, and it's even more convenient because it doesn't even require an internet connection. We can instead- <laughs> that site looks dated. Yes, it does. Yeah, it, it really does. It's a, it's a pretty old website. Um, but it is actually up to date, and so, hey, it's, it's, it, it's useful. Um, but if you want to know how strings work in C, we can use the manual pages. So if I want to know about all the stuff that's in string.h, I can just type man string at the command line, right? So I'm looking for the manual page for the C header string. And it gives me this really, really, really nice under string.h. It gives me this nice synopsis of every single function that is in the string.h header, right? There's Sterlen, there's the one that we talked about. Uh, where are some others? Let's see here. There's Stir Archer, right? And it tells us exactly what we were looking for. Oh, XISZ asks, can I do this on VS Code? Um, I don't think VS Code has access to man pages, and if you're on Windows, you don't have man pages. Something that you may be able to do if you have a fancier IDE, and VS Code with the C extension may be able to do this, is you should be able to like control click on a header file and it gives you the definition and oh boy we're in the microsoft standard library this is never fun oh geez uh and so i can maybe search for stir archer well that wasn't helpful um Oh, geez. Yeah, and then we're going to go to VC runtime string, and maybe that will show us Stir Archer. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, Microsoft has chosen to uh, put precisely zero uh, documentation in their headers. So, if you're on Windows, yeah, Google it. Uh, or your IDE might provide some completion. Oh, uh, Prince Logic, what I did is so in C Lion and Visual Studio, I'll let you do this too. If you just hold down the control key and you click on a header file name, it'll pop up that header file for you. And so yeah, so this is actually the visual C runtime definition of string.h. Um, and yeah, I mean, all of these are by nature open source. And so, you know, I'm not, Microsoft's not going to get mad at me for showing their uh, file on, on stream. Other than that, I am going to roast their code. Oh my goodness, this is win API nonsense. But anyway... Um, right, so you can control click to get a header file. It's also convenient. And in the terminal, what I did is I ran the command man, which stands for access the manual page, and then typed the name of the header file, string. By the way, if you're wondering what a particular function does, so let's say you see stir archer, and you're like, what the hell is that? You can type man stir archer, and it pops up the documentation for that function too. So yeah, the uh, Linux was written in C, and the kind of the standard programming language for Linux is C. Everything on Linux, by and large, uses the C ABI. It's compatible with C. And so as a result, Linux and Unix-based systems, Mac OS has this too, have really awesome documentation for the C standard library. You can access, like, if you want to know what's an STDIO, you can look at that too. And it's going to give you all of the different functions in STDIO. Standard lid, same thing. STD int. In K oh, I guess that's not there. Um, but STD lib is there. Um, well, yeah, so sometimes we have different man pages for different things. Apparently this is giving me the OCaml standard library, but that that's fine. Anyway, but yeah, you can access 
documentation of the standard library very, very easily. And so let's demo how we might use this. Let's say that, uh, let's figure out what do I want to do? Let's see here. Let's just look for a fun function. I'll show you how we might find it. Oh yeah. Let's say that I want to compare two strings. So I want to compare two strings. I want to figure out, are two strings equal? Right? This is something that we do really frequently. And in Java, we wrote string.equal, but we don't have that in C. So let's figure out how am I going to compare two strings? Well, the first thing, I'm trying to determine if two strings are equal. So let's say that I want to, you know, search for equal. And the way that I do that on a man page, because man pages use VI navigation, is I type slash and then the thing I'm looking for, and then I hit enter. Okay, and it said, okay, equal wasn't found in this man page. Well, that wasn't great, but you know, hmm, let's see here. So, you know, equality is really just a type of comparison. So what if I look for comparison instead? Oh, here we go. This is something. Stir case comp, ignoring case. Well, that's not what I want to do. I want to imitate string.equal, which is not case insensitive. So let's move on. Oh, here we go. This I like. Stir comp. String compare. Compare the strings S1 and S2. There's a typo in this. Compare the strings S1 with S2. Compare the string S1 with S2. But anyway, we can use stir comp to compare two strings. So let's look at that. Now, if we switch back into C lion here, I'm going to define another string. I'm going to say char uh, farewell equals goodbye. Okay, great. And so we're going to say, okay, hello and goodbye. So now first, if you want to determine if strings are equal, you may be really optimistic and think that we're working in sane languages that have operator overloading. C doesn't have that. And so if I just try and say, you know, um, you know, print F, uh, greeting equals equals farewell. Then let's see what we get. Yeah, we get false. Those things are not equal. And, you know, that makes sense. That is kind of what we were expecting, right? Because they're different pointers. They're at different addresses in memory. And by doing this equality comparison, remembering that strings are really just pointers to char, we're going to have different addresses for these two pointers. And so when we compare them, they are not equal. But we can use now stir comp to figure out if these things are equal. So I'm going to say stir comp greeting and farewell. And we're going to call stir comp. They're going to say, yeah, so compare two strings is stir comp char pointer s1 pointer char s2. And so now if we run this, we'll see, okay, well, they're not equal right? They're not equal. But uh, Blue Jay, does stir comp work like compare to? It's very similar. But now you'll notice something here. Hmm. Stir comp of greeting farewell equals one. Oh, so greeting and farewell are equal, right? One in C means true. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And this is, again, a very, very, very common mistake that, full disclosure, I make in C all the time. Because I work in other languages too, and this to me is just oftentimes confusing. But anyway, stircomp does not return whether or not the strings are equal. It returns, like BlueJay said, something a lot like a string dot compare to in Java. And so what happens is we iterate through these two strings. And if we encounter a character that is different between the two strings, then we are going to return the difference between this character's ASCII value and this character's ASCII value. So because greeting and farewell, the values were hello and goodbye, H is one letter past G. So when we do H minus G, we get one, and that is what stircomp returns. So just like compared to in Java, if the two strings are equal, then stircomp will return zero. And so if I change both of these to 
uh, you know, a universal greeting slash farewell. Thank you to Lilo and Stitch um, for teaching me this. Then we'll see. Hey, it's true. Great. Yeah. And now if I change these back to our English farewell and greeting and I run it, they are not equal. And so yeah, so strcomp is essentially string.compareTo to for C. It is not string.equals, and if you try and use it like string.equals, like a lot of people do, you will confuse yourself. So yeah, just be very aware of that. And now honestly, we could go on about string.h for a long time. There's all kinds of cool stuff in here. You can duplicate a string in memory. You can randomize a string. Stir fry. But um you can you can yeah, you can randomly swap the characters in a string if you want. Why? Yeah, but you can. Uh you can concatenate things, you can uh you can tokenize strings. You can attempt to separate strings, all kinds of cool stuff that you can do in here. And at some point, almost guaranteed you will be tasked with writing a lot of this functionality. And it's actually really fun. It's really cool. Like, again, you can write this entire header file yourself. There's nothing special about any of this that you can't write yourself. And so, yeah, if you're in a C class and your professor says, hey, write string.h, you're like, Psh, no big deal. I've got it. I know how pointers work. I know how strings work. Easy stuff. And yeah, so that's where I'm going to leave it today with string.h and with our string functions in C. Tomorrow, we are going to talk about another really fun concept in C um, called function pointers. And we are finally going to learn two things that have probably been on your mind for a while. We're going to learn how to structure data. So we're going to learn how to make data structures in C. And we're going to make a data structure. And we're going to learn how header files work. Which is, you know, advanced stuff. We're getting into the point of now where we're not only writing a C program, we're going to write a library in C because that is pretty much the most frequent use of, of C nowadays. Uh, and yeah, XISZ, yep, we're going to be working with structs. Yep, exactly. So yeah, we've got that to look forward to tomorrow. Oh, uh, Divi4K, you've got a question about VS Code and running it on Macs. Sure. Uh, we're in open Q&A now. So if you've got any questions, type them in the chat. More than happy to answer. In some cases, VS Code returns slightly different output. I was wondering if there's a reason for that. If you don't assign an int variable value, it will always be assigned zero? Really? Is that true? Huh. Hmm, that's interesting. That's interesting. You may... Your compiler gave you 788. Oh, oh, you found a compiler that does it left to right. Cool. Okay, right. Yeah. So what you're seeing, Divi, is, is actually nothing that's wrong with your compiler or your computer. It, it's, it's actually completely fine. What you're seeing is undefined behavior. Right? So the two things that you've mentioned are actually two really good examples of undefined behavior in the C spec. So if we just declare a variable and don't assign it a value, what actually happens in C is undefined. We don't know. It could be assigned zero on some platforms. That would be a really helpful platform, but it could just give you a memory address and say you're on your own and give you chunk data. And so, yeah, so you actually, yeah, so we don't know what's going to happen when you do that. And the second one you mentioned is another really good example of argument evaluation order. The order in which the arguments of a function in C are also undefined. We don't know what order the arguments are going to be evaluated in. They could be left to right. They could be right to left. They could be random. It could evaluate them according to a balanced binary tree. Uh, we don't know. We really don't know. And so as a result, yeah, you've seen two examples of undefined behavior. And as long as you are a proactive, defensive C programmer who tries to avoid undefined behavior when you can, we don't want to exploit undefined behavior too much. We can sometimes, but we don't want to do it too frequently. Then you should have no issues uh, with small differences between platforms like that. So yeah, you're all good. There's nothing wrong with your setup. It'll work just fine. Okay, great. Yeah, glad we were able to help. And uh, XISZ asks... Uh, are we talking about linked lists in C at some point? Um, 
We might. So link lists are actually something that I was going to give as an assignment. And so, yeah, at some point, this stream is actually going to have assignments. That's actually probably going to be in maybe two days. Uh, we're going to have our first assignment, and that assignment is going to be writing a linked list. So, yeah, we're totally going to talk about linked lists. They're going to be slightly different linked lists than our Java friends are used to. And so get ready for the fact that, yeah, linked lists can work in some different ways in C. And we're going to show you a really cool way to write a linked list um that does not require as much dynamic allocation as much heap allocation as our java linked lists might have and so yeah we are totally going to talk about uh linked lists and how to write them we're not going to completely write one on stream but we are going to discuss the concepts and some implementation tips for them and so yeah so we will cover linked lists all right great and so <laughs> Looking forward to that. Yes, good. Glad. I'm glad that I'm glad that we've got something to look forward to. And so yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you're you're more than welcome. Uh and so yeah, if anyone else has other questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Um what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and upload our notes to the cloud and post a link to the chat so that you all can access the notes PDF that we we're working with today. So let's go ahead and export this real quick. Going to so you upload this to Google Drive. Excellent. And this is day three of our lecture, if I'm not mistaken. So this is day three that PDF. Go ahead and upload that. All right, yeah, any other questions that y'all have got? And while we wait for questions, I'm actually going to mention something I did some research on from yesterday, and that is why on earth would a compiler evaluate its arguments from right to left? Right, you're kind of like, well, wait a second. Why is a compiler doing things in the least intuitive way possible? Like, this this seems like it's almost trying to trick us, right? Like, it's, it's trying to trap you into encountering undefined behavior. And, you know, that's that's not really the case. It's not that your compiler hates you. Um, although it can, it can feel like that sometimes. It really can. But what's actually happening is it has to do with... Um, the, uh, x86 ABI. And so actually, um, let's hear, actually, uh, Divi 4K, are you still here? No, you left. Okay. Uh, hmm. I was going to ask if she had an ARM Mac or a, um, or an x86 Mac. But anyway, uh, let's see here. Let's share our link here. Share our document. Anyone with the link can access it. So here you go. So here are our notes from today. There's our notes PDF. And now, yeah, let's, let's just, as a final tidbit, talk about argument evaluation order and why it works the way it does. So when we call a function in C, we have to place our arguments somewhere. We have to have some way to tell, um, you know, to, we have to have basically a standard way to send arguments between things. We can't just say, you know, this argument is in this register, and this one is in this memory location, and blah, 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 blah. All right, it gets very confusing, and it limits reuse. So we develop what's called an ABI, or Application Binary Interface, that all applications on a platform should conform to. And so the x86 ABI, since time immemorial, specifies that arguments are pushed onto the stack like this. So here, let's actually go back to our PDF for just one second. So arguments are pushed onto the stack like this. Let's say I've got a function called, uh, you know, let's say we're writing our average function again. And we've got two ints, int in one and int in two. So the way that on x86, we need to pass our arguments to a function, to a call to a2 is like this we are going to push n2 onto the stack first, and then we're going to push n1, where our stack grows downward. And so what's going to happen is when you try and pop something off the stack, the first thing you pop is going to be your first argument. And if you do it again, then we'll get the second argument. And so as a result, in order to push these values in this order, your C compiler evaluates the arguments from right to left. Because we've got to push the n2 first before we push the n1. And so that's why the, the arguments come in the order they do. 
uh, or that's why the argument evaluation order is like that for at least most of our x86 compilers. And yesterday we even tried it out with a really old C compiler, and I was kind of thinking that, hey, what if it's what if it's different? Um, and no, the argument evaluation order was the same because the uh, the x86 ABI still specified that we were pushing uh, arguments to the stack in that order. So yeah, there you go. That's one last little bit of information for today. I'm going to let y'all go. This was a little bit of a longer stream again, but we got through a lot. We now know how arrays and strings work in C. And, and it, yeah, and yeah, sorry, yeah, that's interesting. Great. I'm glad you found that interesting. Yeah, it is. It is really cool. Uh, and yeah, that's why I wanted to ask if, um, if that user shows up again tomorrow, then I'm going to go ahead and ask them what architecture their, um, their Mac is running. Because if they have an Apple Silicon ARM Mac, then the ARM ABI might actually specify arguments or pushed the other way. Uh, so yeah, I actually really want to know that now. Yeah, anyway, I am going to end the stream here. Thank you all for watching. We're going to come back tomorrow, and yeah, we're going to talk about data structures and C. We might talk a little bit about the heap. We might talk about function pointers, all kinds of stuff we're going to do. It should be uh, a pretty interesting day. So yeah, I hope everyone enjoys it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all for coming, and I will see you tomorrow.